All right. Hey, Priyanka. Hey, Alex. Hey. Yeah, so uh, maybe we'll kick off just by introducing ourselves to our many, many listeners. Sure. <laughs> Do you want to go first, uh, Priyanka? Sure. Um, thanks. Um, so I, I'm Priyanka Desai. I lead um, business development and operations for Open Law. Um, I guess by way of my background, um, I'm a lawyer. I spent some time at a financial blockchain consortium um, through law school working at R3. Also spent some time um, doing some regulatory work at the New York State Department of Financial Services, which uh, regulates cryptocurrency and um, under something called a bit license. Um, and then just through law school wrote quite a bit on Ethereum and smart contracts, um, both its enforceability and some arbitration tooling around that. And um, prior to law school, uh, worked in politics on Capitol Hill. And now find myself at Open Law. Cool. How long have you been at Open Law? I've been at Open Law for about two years and we were founded in May, 2017. Alex? Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm Alex Sitar. Um, I'm the platform engineering lead at Ujo, um, handling most of the backend development, a smart contract for general uh, just technical architecture. And uh, that kind of bubbles up into some product stuff too, inherently, um, considering we're a small team. Um, before Ujo, I spent uh, five years at another music technology company called Song Trust, which is part of Downtown Music Publishing, um, where we ended up building um, a royalty uh, monetization and collection platform um, to automate uh, payments that would ease the, uh, I guess, publishing admin for songwriters or their uh, managers. Um, and then prior to that, I was, uh, I did also my uh, master's degree at NYU in music technology. So there's uh, clearly this is a passion of mine that has I've been working on for a while. Um, oh, yeah, wow. I didn't realize you've been uh, in the music technology uh, area for so long. I was, that's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, Some, somehow kept it going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, so Russell Verbeaten, uh, um, been an uh, engineer, uh, electrical engineer originally, but got into software after graduating, been in startups basically for the last 15 years, um, CTO, um, founder of a couple mobile um, tech companies early on. And then after that, after kind of six years in the mobile space, oh, I guess longer, um, a few years after that, I ended up getting involved in Ethereum in the early days in, in Toronto, where I'm from. Um, met Joe Lubin and then joined Consensus, I guess, about four and a half years ago, where I've played a bunch of different roles from, call it product management to operations and uh, regional lead. And uh, yeah, thanks guys for, for joining. Um, yeah, these days I'm one of the things I'm doing is just exploring an idea around an application portal. So I have a very simple view of the world here on a slide that I'll show you. Awesome, thanks. So um, you think of um, the blockchain world as uh, three layers, where layer one is the blockchain, layer two are um, uh, like a service layer, um, sometimes we call these dApps, let's say. So in my world, um, you know, Open Law is a service and Ujo is a service and there are many other services out there. And the idea is um, wondering the extent to which end users might start leveraging these services by engaging in applications that speak to one or more service and create kind of more niche use cases for them. Um, uh, beyond that, there is some expectation that, um, you know, if we can um, do things like provide insurance 
for different types of wallets um, and, and for the underlying services, um, there could this application portal could actually be, um, you know, if, if all the apps on them um, speak to services that have been vetted and use appropriate wallets for um, those um, for 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 the for particular services, then user end users could actually um, be in like kind of a protected environment where they execute these use cases. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think there'll be some more to discuss as it relates to the hypothetical use case that we're contemplating today. But maybe before we do that, we should get everyone who's, who's potentially listening to this up to speed on each of the services that you guys uh, that your teams are working on. So I don't know who should go first. Maybe um, does anyone want to go first? Alex? That doesn't matter. Sure, I can go. Yeah, so Ujo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Ujo is a music platform under consensus, um, uses blockchain. Ethereum blockchain specifically is a substrate to empower artists to, just, <laughs> to digitize their um, their music rights and metadata. Um, I guess this enables them to share the information in uh, like an open environment, um, which will allow new applications and products and services, um, maybe kind of like the one you're discussing, or um, this like portal sort of thing that you've discussed um, to license their catalogs and then pay artists directly with minimal friction. Um, that's that's the general gist of it. Um, I guess beyond the the high level of that um, at Uja, we've worked on um, various products over the years, um, beginning with uh, an original prototype that was built in 2015. Um, Imogen, uh, tiny human. Exactly. Yes. Um, so that was that was really actually one of the first times Ethereum was used for anything else beyond uh, trading tokens or you know financial sort of uh, activity. So that was a song that she wrote about her new um, baby, I believe. I, I believe so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then it was a song that people could buy with Ether. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she is a pioneer in some ways. So she had thought of this concept of, you know, using a tool um, to be able to pay artists directly and like have the, the copyrights and everything just directly encoded into the music. Um, and it wasn't directly encoded in the music per se um, for that release, but uh, she realized the power of uh, the blockchain to fulfill that role. Um, so that was the first time any music single was um, I guess, available for purchase via the blockchain. Um, and the smart contract, which was developed for the prototype, uh, did encode all of the uh, splits for each artist so that when people purchased it, um, the money just got divvied up and went into the, I guess, Ethereum accounts of, of each owner um, in what is, I guess, an Ethereum block time, you know, which is seconds instead of potentially months or years that it would traditionally take to get like a royalty payment in like the traditional uh, <laughs> ecosystem. So that, that was a really cool um, demonstration. That was before I actually joined the project. Um, so the, the project kind of laid dormant for um, about a year and a half or so. Can I, before. Can I just, can I just interrupt? So back in the day, yeah. I was actually, um, I project managed that, uh, that, phase of Ujo, but that but that was it. I wasn't involved in it. But I I got to meet Imogen Heap through that. And just the funny story there is that I bumped into her and I think she sold, I can't remember exactly, but I think she sold like a thousand dollars worth of tiny human songs. Mm -hmm. Um but and so that but that ether ended up becoming worth like or maybe it was a hundred, but that ether ended up becoming worth like a hundred thousand dollars. And so she, she actually was able to use that money 
to like fund the development of um, her fancy music love or something like that? Yeah, um, that's oh. definitely impossible, but she also has her own project, Mycelia, that sort of is like a continuation of um, sort of the ideas of, of like this like right. payment network for artists. Yeah, so anyway, I just thought that it's just such a funny anecdote that she sold like a hundred bucks worth of music and then a couple years later, Ether went up and she had all this money to, to <laughs> invest in Didn't that account. happen with, with like 50 Cent too? Like he took one of his albums in Bitcoin and didn't realize he like had this huge wallet full of Bitcoin and then later <laughs> found out he had like millions of dollars in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, I remember I I that. Saw something like about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah he just like crazy. about it. Yeah. So we um, we had discussed at one point that it it's quite we'd have to do some more research into this, but it's quite possible that that single release was the least sold. But highest grossing Making for the of all time. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like for the amount due to of course like the user experience at the time being like even more complicated that like the Ethereum ecosystem in UX has evolved so much and of course it still has its pain points but yeah. the fact that you know people still jump through the hoops to to do it back then the the sale the amount of sales was very low but the <laughs> the gross value is pretty pretty interesting awesome. um but yeah i guess to move forward um beyond that um i, I joined the team um in january 2017 um and that was during a time when there was sort of like a new uh there had been some r d done um in 2016 um and consensus had been talking to other labels, publishers, basically anyone that would uh, listen that had an interest in um, blockchain tech for the music industry. Um, so there was some R&D done and there was a, a concept of what could be useful for the industry. So when I jumped on the team, um, there was a, another prototype in development that was essentially going to be a music portal um, that would enable artists to upload their own music and um, and, and be able to kind of like recreate what Imogen Heap had as like a, that was a custom project built specifically for her. Um, <clears throat> the problem is it was lacking some components, um, but we eventually, uh, we scrapped that prototype as I came on board, built out a whole new backend, built out, built out the engineering team. Like once I came on, uh, we hired another, we hired our uh, lead full-time front end developer. Um, and pretty much the two of us sort of like paired on what would become uh, the, the the main Ujo portal, which it continues to be sort of our like longest standing uh, application that we've supported to date. Um, which is kind of interesting because actually right before we developed that, um, it was validating because we also did a collaboration with the artist RAC, who wanted something very similar to what Image and Heap wanted, except for an album instead. So we, we knew that there are artists out there that want the ability to release their music on a blockchain platform, get paid in crypto and directly instead of having to wait for royalty payments. Um, so as soon as we were done with that project, we just like went uh, full steam ahead on development of the Ujo portal. Um, so yeah, it was the first, I guess, decentralized music store of its kind that allowed artists to, and still does allow them to upload music um, around the same time as when the uh, ERC 721 uh, uh, spec came out. And uh, it's interesting because with the release of the RAC store, uh, we had already envisioned the potential for collectibles on the blockchain. Um, the ERC 721 came out like, I think a couple weeks after we released that, that, um, that album. Um, so we had issued ERC 20 tokens for everyone um, that bought the album sort of as like a collectible, but you, them being fungible didn't really satisfy that sort of like you individual, like unique uh, item for each purchase. So um, when we continued to build out the portal, we moved to ERC 721. So 
for every album that's purchased on the Ujo platform, um, the, the buyer receives a collectible of that record, kind of like in the analog of like, you go to the vinyl store and you buy a record, like you have that as like a keepsake and you should be able to, you know, transfer cool. it if you want later. Um, yeah. So, uh, since then, we've kind of done a lot of new R&D and have started building out new tools and sort of generalizing some of the stuff that was involved in the portal to make it so that um, it's not necessarily just a consumer facing application um, because we've, we've gotten feedback and just from the learnings of launching the portal and seeing the traction and continuing to see like the UX hurdles that still exist um, in the space today. Uh, there is, I think, still an ability to, to build some some more enterprise focused tools. So that's currently what we've been working on a little bit with what we've been calling smart licensing. Um, smart licensing essentially is like uh, kind of an advancement of the licenses that we used on the original Ujo portal. Um, so we've developed a way to sort of issue uh, licenses as NFTs. I actually know that OpenLaw is on something similar. So there's probably some overlap here. Um, but one thing we also noticed is that uh, in at least in the music world, there's sort of like a, a demand for like scarce items. Like, you know, sometimes uh, an artist might only release like 100 copies of like their record. And once they're once they're out, that's that, that's it. And we were asking ourselves how we could use Ethereum to sort of like recreate that um, feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, the new system that we've designed allows like content creators or their managers to uh, issue like uh, a select supply amount of whatever product they're releasing. It's actually generalized enough that it doesn't necessarily have to be for music. We've just continued to use that as like the focus since it's our expertise. Um, and then, yeah, when, when buyers purchase each product, it's uh, essentially an NFT that can unlock a, like a access to, to that item digitally. Interesting. <clears throat> um, and then I guess the final thing that we've been working on is uh, sort of uh, an extension of uh, a lot of the work with Simon being on our team and him like writing a lot about curation markets. Um, so we, we also, you know, as music fans ourselves, uh, sort of like like the curation of music and um, see the value in people kind of like uh, bubbling up like great content to the top. So we focused on building out a chart application, which is we currently have a prototype of um, that actually allows you to post links of music that's not necessarily on the Ujo portal, but like YouTube links and stuff like that also. And then uh, users can vote on what the good content is. Um, they can vote by it, uh, putting in a token and then there's a sort of exponential decay of like tokens they receive if like more people start uploading that content. So it's supposed to incentivize, um, I guess, human curation over uh, you know, algorithmic curation, which I think is something that we really want to see more experimentation with. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. I had no idea you guys were working on curation markets at Ujo. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's been a little underground for a couple of months. Um, we're actually launching a new homepage soon. But oh, should, cool. You know. So, so the so the main the the main focus is still the uh, licensing um, infrastructure, and there's uh, it sounds like there's some some new enterprise tools. Um, that leverage um, various um, uh, uh, EIP standards for NFTs to enable um, exclusive content um, and other other types of uh, other types of uh, badges. Exactly. Yep. And the the licensing infrastructure is is not just for music now. Um, and it extends, um, it generalizes kind of what the proof of concept uh, that the, the Ujo team did many years ago with Image and Heat to all sorts of content and all sorts of licensing 
arrangement? Yeah, that's the general idea. And and as a as a developer accessing um, the Ujo platform, um, do I access it directly through calling the blockchain where this where the smart contract license lives, or is there like an Ujo um, API that I speak to? Um, that's a good question. It's currently a little, it's still relatively in development, but the, so it's mostly uh, directly on blockchain right now. Like if the smart contracts are all open source, but we, the goal is to move to the latter that you said, like we prefer more like an SDK to API sort of framework. And we, um, it's definitely been like a little bit of like research and development on there. We've been iterating on a, on a bunch and trying to figure out how to like make the UX smooth, but that's sort of where we see it going and what we would think would be the best experience for developers. Awesome. Thanks Alex. There's uh, still a lot of awesome work going on you, Joe. That's great. <laughs> yeah. um, I love that you guys are kind of bringing up back hype them too, but for, but with blockchain. And token. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely something like, we referenced a bunch. And um, I loved Hypem. I actually like know the the founder of uh, Hypem and uh, one of like the early developers there. So I've gotten some like feedback from them too, which is That's cool. cool. That's great. Cool. Um, Priyanka, do you, yeah. uh, would you give us uh, an overview uh, similar to Alex's, but for OpenWorld? Sure. Um, so, like I said, we've been around since 2017. Um, much of this project was like born from Aaron Wright. He's a law professor as well, but a lot of his research um, sort of realized that we needed to mend the relationship with both developer and lawyer and kind of scaling the use of smart contracts. So, with Open Law, we are trying to build the commercial rails for blockchain. And by that, I mean, um, I guess just stripping away the hype that we read about with blockchain. Um, blockchains really excel at tracking and transferring digital assets and those digital assets can be native crypto um, so like ETH, Bitcoin um, or they can be tokens memorializing any sort of property rights so um, you know we've heard a lot of uh, fractional ownership of art and real estate so those property rights um, as well as uh, intellectual property as well so that's kind of more relevant for the conversation here um, but the idea is, especially with regard to these property tokens, if you will, um, they really need to have their rights and obligations memorialized in a human readable way to give them any sort of real world significance. Um, and so smart contracts have limitations in that regard. They're really nothing, more, they're great, but they're really nothing more than lines of code that transfer these digital assets. So um, the thesis with open law is to kind of solve for that and really bring these assets um, to capital markets and um, real world uh, tangible uses, um, we need to have that legal wrapping paper around these smart contracts. Um, so with Open Law, we've created a protocol that can take any legal template. Um, so uh, in this case, let's say it's like a investor agreement or a copyright agreement you can mark it up in our domain specific markup language, which is publicly available. Um, this markup language resembles like typical legal uh, bracketed language, so it's not super complicated. Um, I'm not a technologist by any means, and I, I can find my way around that like within a day, so it's not too hard. Um, but uh, that, after you mark up that document, effectively turns that legal template into a data object, so a JSON object. Um, at which point you can embed a smart contract into that agreement. So um, let's say you're paying uh, someone um, through escrow. Once the performance is completed, you can press a button and all of the funds get transferred after the agreement's been signed. So what's actually uh, communicated on to the blockchain is um, really both the signature and the, the calls to the smart contract. Um, so, and then the document is living off chain and referenced on chain. 
Um, so with Open Law, um, that's kind of like the fundamental protocol. We also have a few other product features. So we have something, um, we have like a workflow tool called Flows, um, which effectively turns uh, a legal template into partition parts where you can permission access um, after certain conditions are met. Um, so we just released that. We also have um, an integration framework which allows you to integrate with third parties. So that could be like CoinMarketCap's API or um, DocuSign's API if you want to use their signature solution. Uh, we also have something called Forms, um, which turns a legal template, uh, you, not normally like the legal a contract that you've seen, but it actually turns it into a form where you can pick different buttons and based on your inputs, um, a certain agreement gets uh, spit back out to you. Um, and uh, it's, I guess this, this is part of our infrastructure, but another feature of open law is um, that we have like a secure Scala container that sits off chain. So we are a layer two, two solution that sits off chain. Um, and that's really where the data of the contract and the smart contract lives. Um, and so if you want to schedule smart, con uh, schedule smart contracts, so right now, I mean, people don't often think about this, but smart contracts are really only good for like one-off transactions. Um, and that's really great and exciting. However, uh, many complex transactions require certain conditions and then you want to have certain smart contracts get called based on certain conditions or you want it to be at a certain time. There's no real clock in blockchain. So what we've done by kind of having that off chain, you can actually schedule different smart contract calls. Um, and more, moreover, um, if you want to amend the smart contract, so let's say both parties agree that the payment terms change, you can actually amend that smart contract and the payment terms will change. Um, if you want to stop the smart contract, you can actually do that as well. Um, so the relayer gives, so you can sever the connection from the smart contract to a blockchain. Um, and uh, what's also interesting is uh, for the document and contract itself, it lives off chain, as I mentioned, and referenced on chain. We're implementing something called Secure Scuttlebutt or SSB, which is a pretty awesome uh, decentralized storage uh, protocol. Uh, where it basically, it's not blockchain, but it def it breaks up um, the agreement into little bits and the only people that have access to those agreements are those that are parties of the agreement uh, itself. Um, but we are super modular and flexible. So if you don't necessarily want it, your documents stored locally or stored on SSB, you can really store it on any database you'd like. Um, so we're, we're pretty flexible there. And like I said, the integration framework allows for uh, different signature solutions and different um, third party APIs to interact. So you can think of like Stripe or otherwise. So um, the idea there is um, we're, yeah, like I said, pretty um, fluid and um, we, we want to make it so that building dApps on top of us is super easy. So kind of what Stripe is for payments, like we really want to be operate on the back end. You can like reskin um, re, re, like structure the way that the app looks and just call our API and use us as you please, um, to the extent you want. Um, and I actually have like this really interesting chart that kind of reminded me of what you shared too. That is like just in our general overview deck, deck that I think is actually, I think we're just like on like thinking in a parallel fashion where you have like, that's always you know, good to hear. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it was like worth mentioning. So you have like the Ethereum blockchain um, and that's that fundamental data structure, right? And then beyond that, you like really have these like core pieces that need to build out to really scale the tech. So from our vantage point, um, we believe like identity and attestation is really important. And um, Consensus is a great project called Viewport that's working towards this. There's a lot of folks working towards this. It's a tough problem, uh, not problem, but it's definitely an issue. Um, that I think a lot of people are trying to solve for. Um, and then there's also this notion of like, how can I purchase um, or sell these digital assets? Um, who's gonna hold on to them? How do I custody them? And then what really sits between that is open law. And then once you really have that legal protocol that ties the parties and their rights and obligations together, so you tie the identity, the legal, and then the exchange together, you can really start thinking about um, a flourishing token economy. So um, yeah, I, I mean, and that including um, kind of what we're discussing today. So once you kind of nail those fundamentals, you can just start thinking about really different dApps um, in that layer three that you kind of were speaking of, of before too. 
Um, and just to kind of give you some context, we have been around for, yes, like I said, like two years. Um, and uh, we've kind of partnered both, we've been thinking about open finance and also on the enterprise side as well. Uh, we're kind of, again, thinking about both of those things in sort of like a concurrent parallel track. So on, um, you know, on the enterprise side, we've had great partnership with partnerships with trade associations and working with the loan syndication trade association to put syndicated loan agreements on open law. Um, we've also partnered with a large consumer legal tech company called Rocket Lawyer. And they tend to do more like the small and medium sized businesses legal forms like your NDAs and um, bill of sale and those kind of agreements. Um, and we've also um, partnered with other large legal publishers as well, like Thomson Reuters and other crypto startups and the like, um, which has been really interesting and a great learning experience. Um, so, so there's a lot going on on that end. Um, we're also on the open finance side. Uh, we kind of, there, there's been a lot of conversations around DAOs and uh, this notion of a decentralized organization um, over the past, like, year, I mean, since the DAO in 2016, but I would say it's really revved up like since in the last year. Um, and we kind of realized that uh, there's like a lot of projects and because we can build these spin up dApps so quickly with um, the open law protocol that it would be really interesting to put together the legal structuring around a for profit limited liability um, autonomous organization or the Lao as we're calling it um and it's a really great showcase and product of our tools but also just like a a pretty good um use case um so we we're pretty excited about that as far as like the um open finance stuff goes and and we're hopefully going to launch that in early january amazing um well you guys have been um up to so much it's uh it's hard to keep track i think of all the different areas that open law is playing, but I guess it makes sense as the general kind of legal infrastructure service. Um, so, I mean, it, it sounds, it sounds, um, and correct me where I got this wrong, but it sounds like um, one way to think of, of open law is that um, it'll, it'll generate um, uh, human readable legal contracts um, that, um, it'll manage signatures um, on your behalf, either blockchain signatures or it'll allow you to integrate other signing um, type services like DocuSign mm -hmm. and, um, and then it will instantiate blockchains at the right point in the flow, which is actually one of your features. Right. It's like a multi-flow legal contract system yeah. and then if something if there is something wrong and you need to pull it back the system has the capability to uh, allow parties to agree to update the legal contract to basically point to somewhere new on the blockchain or nowhere at all right required exactly but, yes yeah fair and, um, yep. rehash yep yes that's great um yeah definitely and 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 uh, because like legal is so pervasive in every single industry, there's been like a lot of different directions we could take this. So um, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, there's a lot going on, but um, yeah, I think you summed that up quite well. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, great. So maybe um, what I'll do now is try to um, jump back to the deck I shared earlier. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're talking about um, this application portal where users can access um, insured applications that are niche and speak to their needs and are built on what's called two or more underlying services. Um, and so when I was um, thinking about a poten potential use case for this hypothetical application portal, um, it was about a musician seeking investment to produce a music video. And so the scenario is a musician is seeking to produce a song and a music video. Their investor friend is interested in helping with the costs. 
So the musician wants to be able to set out the costs online, um, basically send a link to the investor who is then able to enter into an investment contract. Um, and the idea would be that once the song has been produced and the music video is finished, the license rights would be tracked on, on why well, I mentioned Ujo by name there, but would be tracked for the user by the application. And obviously the, the idea is that Ujo would be powering that in the back end. And so we, we just go back to that view again and there's this layer three application, um, this music investor application, um, and it's basically speaking to open law and Ujo. Um, and so I think the, the, one of the questions that I have is given the state of open law and Ujo, um, is could this application be built with by using a standard um, web development app without really needing to know too much about the blockchain? Could uh, could our development team building the music investor application know things just about Open Law and just about Ujo? I mean, I, I, I would just jump in to say, I, th I think so. Um, so with open law, like you really don't need to be a hardcore dev. I would say that the only place where you would need it, they would ne not necessarily need to know anything about blockchain, but just more creating a, a, a nice user experience and, and flow for the user. But on the back end, at least for the in music investor application piece, um, you really could just Put together, you, you could just grab a generalized investor um, agreement, uh, mark that up on open law in a private instance if you'd like, um, have the parties onboarded onto that, fill out the various variables and fields. Um, of course, the users would need to have some sort of wallet, so let's say MetaMask, um, to then pay one party to another, and then that could be whipped up pretty quickly, at which point, like, there could be a token generated by Ujo or um, yeah, a token generated by Ujo, then then thereafter and U it could kind of kick over to Ujo to like track those assets. I mean, that's how I see it, but um, I mean, I'd love to. I, I don't think that, uh, uh, I, I think that this could be spun up fairly seamlessly. Yeah, um, I guess that would be one question is like once the, I mean, I can, based on what you described from Open Law, I could see how an investment contract for a music video could be um, enabled on open law pretty seamlessly. Right. Um, but then I guess, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, you mentioned like a token there. Um, but I mean, to me, that would be like the, the license rights that end up living on an Ujo system. How would those things maybe speak to each other? So, so I mean, on an open law, we could generate, so we can actually generate tokens on open law. Um, so if you, if the, um, if the, uh, if the content creator wanted to genera gener uh, generate a tokenized license and then in return for some sort of payment uh, based on the investor or some sort of rights or an IOU um, of those rights or, or something of that, depending on like how you'd want to actually structure that, um, you could then have that token to the investor, the payment could then go to the content creator to create the music video. And then um, thereafter, Ujo could manage all of the rights using their platform. I mean, Alex, I'd love to know your thoughts. But that's kind of how I would envision it, I think. Yeah, I, I think that generally makes sense to me. Um, there's, yeah, there would be multiple ways to do it. And I guess if, you know, Open law is are are the tokens that you mentioned. Is that are those also NFTs or what? How is that? Yeah, we can yeah. NFTs. Yeah, so um, it really would just depend on like um, I guess that that NFT represents the like the legal agreement between the parties. Is that what? It, 
what it represents. It could represent the license, or and or it could on or you could make it such that it just represents the legal agreement too. Um, I see. So I mean, you could make it so that it represents the legal agreement, and then you get the license once you go to Ujo. Um, but either or, I think, would probably work. Yeah, would the license mm -hmm. the license need to be specified in the contract? I would think. Like if I like so if I'm the investor and I give five thousand dollars to to the to the musician to produce a music video, then I guess I want I want to know what my what my rights are on if that thing gets watched a thousand times on YouTube. That wouldn't be very much. Let's call it a million a million times on YouTube. <laughs> And so I guess once the payment's been made and the song's been produced or the music video has been produced, then the open law contract would have to kick something over to Ujo and then Ujo could start tracking the performance of the, of the music video. They could track their performance and then you could have a smart contract also tied to like every time the uh, tokenized license that was generated from, from that contract exchange, you could have like a real time payment for the investor too, I would imagine. Um, That's what I would, yeah. So there'd be like a license in the investment contract that okay. let's keep it simple, like 50% for the artists and, and all the people involved in making the music video and 50% for the investor. So right. there'd be a bunch of different people mm -hmm. and then, yeah. And then the payment would flow automatically or be managed mm -hmm. by Ujo. Yeah. Um, that would, that would be possible using uh, the framework we have now. And also I guess maybe one aspect we haven't touched on yet is potentially tracking the, the metadata of the, of the copyrights too, um, which I think, that is partially handled by open loss, uh, like off chain system. Um, we've also, I think you mentioned in some of your questions um, about Koala IP, which is a framework we've worked on um, and developed the JavaScript implementation, um, which is basically uh, an IP framework that's like blockchain ready, um, but it encapsulates sort of like a, a That allows for like creating objects such as like music recordings, uh, music releases, um, uh, like songwriter, um, and then keeping track of each of those uh, objects uh, in an opt-in system, which traditionally we've done in IPFS, but technically you can do it in, in any database decentralized or not. Hmm. Yeah, I did. I did notice that the Qualo, Qualo IP standard. Um, yeah, I think the the question I, I mentioned that in was what what's the best way, and I think this is what we're talking about now. Is what is the best way for the contract and open law as it moves through its life cycle to interact with the Ujo licensing system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's. Uh... I think there would still be things to figure out because there's definitely a lot of overlap between what open law has built and what we have. So uh, it's probably no surprise that we've had uh, similar conversations like interoperability between our platforms like over the last couple of years yeah. um, because there, there are similarities and I think they could, uh, you know, correlate well with each other or, or benefit each other. Yeah. I, I definitely see like um, open law in that situation, like operating more on the like just back end payments and um, and like legal stuff. So like as far as the tracking and how that actually would look and feel and kind of what happens with that, I feel like would be just simply because we don't have like the domain domain expertise on like how royalty rights are actually managed and how copyright and, and intellectual property rights are managed. I feel like Ujo would definitely take the uh, take the reins there. Yeah, totally. And then I guess like in the future, you know, I see this kind of like moving in a way that like, if you have sort of this like backend system that simplifies it, all of this, like maybe it, you know, proposes the, 
possibility for like a next gen like Fujo portal that is uh, more advanced than the one we built um, that's currently running. And or other like or other interesting like consumer facing applications that you know the, some of this stuff like the UX hurdles will be lowered. So I think it really will be possible to have a more inclusive system. So um, yeah, we're running up uh, running up on time, guys. Uh, interesting conversation, definitely some food for thought. I think we're just kind of scratching the surface, but. Um, what do you guys what, what do you guys feel in terms of how um, uh, I think the question was you know how how we could envision a layer three application providing an integrated user experience for the main actors in this use case so uh, the investor and the musician and their collaborators um, I think the the expectation would be that the investor having an application built on top of Openlong Ujo would have uh, one place to go and see their investment contract or be able to access it um, and also be able to uh, track the the performance of their investment or the um, the ongoing royalty payments that are accruing to the investor. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe, how do you guys see that working? Is it not super useful because it's really just a question of links into your respective systems? Or is there some need that you guys are rocking for this layer three? Um, this layer three application that gives um, these types of users a more consolidated experience. Uh, I think it, I think it's validating in the way that um, potentially some of the ways that we've thought about our services um, could line up quite well to allow another third party um, application developer to to build on top. Like uh, Priyanka mentioned, Stripe. I thought that's like a great example. We've actually thought about that in a similar way at Ujo too. So making it so that non-blockchain uh, developers have the tools to easily uh, plug into blockchain systems via like an SDK and API like interface, so, you know, two ways or whatever. Um, but yeah, I would be interested to hear Priyanka's thoughts on that too. Yeah, no, I mean, that's definitely the goal of OpenLaw. Like we want to make it really easy so you can just like spin up dApps really quickly. So I think, like for a layer three application portal, I definitely think with both definitely think with both Ujo and OpenLaw you could do this. You would probably like to your point want to have like a custom portal where both music investors and artists, content creators can congregate and decide what they want to do with one another with like both OpenLaw and Ujo doing all like the heavy lifting on the back end. But the point is like the way that we've built it, um, and I think Ujo is thinking about it similarly, is like we really just want to be Rails where you can very quickly just like get a couple of front end developers come together, think about creating like a pleasurable user experience, and then it operate and pinging the OpenLaw or Ujo API whenever you need to, or whenever it makes sense. Amazing. Well, thanks guys. It was great talking with you. I'm going to stop recording now. Yeah, thanks. And unless there's anything else to share, pressing thoughts. We covered it all, I think. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no. yeah thank you for facilitating. It's great. Thanks, guys. That was fun. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you.